Should be recording now. Yes. Welcome everyone. Good morning. Uh, starting today, this is more or less how we will be having our lesson. I will be recording a few minutes of video from my house. This one is going to be a bit longer because it's a bit of a long topic. Uh, there will uh, I will share every every lesson. I will share my videos with you, and uh, there will also be some written transcripts. Of the videos which will include the most important concepts and since this is part of a GCSE module I will also be asking you every lesson to answer an exam question and you will need to do that on the Google form I will set up every time I hope this is clear if by any chance you cannot answer the Google form write it on your books write it on a piece of paper take a picture with your phone and send it to me or even better send it to me via email so I can look at it now we have already looked at how an exam answer should be structured with an introduction listing the main points then a series of paragraphs explaining each point using a variant of the build structure if you still feel feel you need more scaffolding I've also included the usual prepare your prepare your answer table to help you with the structure uh, those are in the instructions of the task where you will also find a file with the notes. This is, of course, a stopgap measure while I prepare the files with the notes for the entire module, as I already did with the American West. Now, uh, now the last thing, uh, remember to write your name in the Google form. Yes, and remember to answer the question to the best of your ability. While we are at home now, it will end and then you will have to do your GCSE and uh, you will need to study and you will need to prepare. So everything helps. We are preparing to run a marathon and we'll, we will need to be ready. Okay. If the form doesn't work again, send me an electronic copy or just write it in your book and send me a picture. If you have any doubt or questions, write a comment somewhere and I'll try to reply and sort things out to the best of my ability. I'm not an IT technician, but I know a few things and I'll do my best to find a solution. Now, now that's, uh, that the paperwork is out of the way, let's do some history. Today we're talking about the significance of the defeat of the Spanish Armada. Significance is always sort of a tricky subject for historians, also because pretty much everything is significant in one way or another. However, there are some events, like the defeat of a gigantic fleet sent out to invade England, that are uh, a bit more, uh, have a bit more a clearer significance than other events. In this lesson, uh, we will try to see why the fact that the Spanish fleet, led by the Duke of Medina Sidonia, was unable to launch an invasion in England, why this was a hugely significant event. And in doing so, we will be looking at three main points. So, read. Uh, oh. First of all, it confirmed Elizabeth's success as a ruler. This is a short term consequence, okay? How it impacted the Brit English politics in the late 16th century. Then, it marked an end to Spanish ambitions in the region. This is a medium term consequence which had impacts in. Uh, decades rather than in years okay it changed the world in uh, how the world was in the following decades rather than in just the following years finally the long-term consequences here we're talking about centuries is the beginning of an english and later british naval supremacy over pretty much every waterway in the world now of course to fully understand what we have been talking about what we will be talking about you will need to have in, to have listened to the previous lesson which I'm sure you all did but here is a quick rundown of the situation first of all uh, Philip II of the situation of the Armada okay so what happened with the Spanish Armada first of all Philip II needed England for his European strategy aimed at destroying the power of its arch enemy the Kingdom of France okay England was not an enemy of Spain at the time, not as much as France was. The main preoccupation of Philip was beating France, and to do that, he needed England. His strategies went out of the window as soon as his wife Mary, the famous Bloody Mary, died 
died in 1558 and his Protestant half-sister Elizabeth was crowned queen and refused to help him. Meanwhile, first meanwhile, there's going to be a couple of meanwhiles. The Dutch decided to start this horrendously huge uprising against the Spanish rule in the Netherlands. And despite of all odds, they are able to resist. Mostly because instead of fighting in the open, in open battle, they just locked themselves inside those new impregnable fortresses that had been built by the Spanish themselves and flood absolutely everything as soon as an enemy army approaches. Now, the Netherlands are called the Netherlands because they are below sea level. They are protected from the sea by a system of dams and dikes. They open the dams flooded the fields, the Spanish could not get any food, they were forced to retreat, and hey, they saved the day. It was a terrifyingly long uh, war, like the, the Vietnam War of the, Spanish, of the Spanish Empire. The Dutch also happened to be Protestant, a different variant of Protestantism, but Protestant nonetheless, which for Elizabeth was absolutely great, because now she can use this religious solidarity against the Catholics, Remember, Catholics and Protestants tend to be at odd in this time, to send the Dutch supplies, to give them support. Dutch pirates are allowed to use the English ports. And finally, to send troops to the raid. She sent 6,000 men to aid the rebellion, and her lover and favourite, Sir Robert Dudley, Earl of Leicester, was eventually even elected as the Governor-General of the United Provinces, this sort of uh, rebel Dutch Republic even though nobody really listened to him. Meanwhile, second meanwhile, the English privateers and the Spanish Navy are fighting this sort of undeclared war in the Atlantic, which is costing Spain millions, millions for, uh, because the, the English are stealing a lot of gold coming from America, millions because you have to prepare new fleets and convoys in order to guard the treasure fleets, and in general it's not a very cheap affair. Now, seeing that A, Elizabeth is Protestant, B, she is helping his enemies in the Netherlands, and C, she is stealing his gold, Philip eventually decides to uh, put together a fleet and show her who is boss. Now, this of course all fails due to three main problem uh, points. I don't know if you can read this. One. English naval commanders, people like Francis Drake, knew what they were doing, okay, they were doing it well, they were using their strengths, the uh, flexibility of the English fleet, the fact that they had the slightly better guns and more agile ships, uh, compared to the rather bulky and uh, uncomfortably slow Spanish ships. Two, the logistical nightmare of picking up and disembarking troops across the channel, a series of uh, problems in communications, uh, the inability to coordinate between the army that was supposed to invade England and the fleet that was supposed to pick them up. Remember, this is before cell phones, this is before telegraphs. You actually had to send a guy running to some other place in order to communicate. This was not always feasible. So, due to these problems, uh, they were not able to pick up the soldiers. And three, third main point, English weather, also known as bad weather. So, due to these three factors, the Armada fails in its mission. The ships are then scattered, and England lives sort of happily ever after, at least until the Civil War in the 1640s. So, these were the causes very briefly now. But why are we talking about it, okay? Uh, 450 years, 460 years after it happened. Of course, uh, it's probably going to be in the exam is a very good point, and I understand that. But also because this event, you have to understand, that changed the history of the world, okay? We cannot know what would have happened if the Spanish had actually landed on English soil in 1588. Uh, some people, uh, like the historian and novelist, uh, what's his name, Harry Tarteldove, uh, he wrote a novel saying the, the, Eng the Spanish conquered everything, put on an inquisition like the Spanish Inquisition, and everybody was miserable. Geoffrey Parker, who is uh, an expert historian in the subject, and also one of my favorite historians, great, great writer, he generally assumes that uh, the Spanish army would have just conquered London, 
and would have imposed some demands uh, rather than conquering the entire country. It would, have, it would have just been a show of force. Nevertheless, we can assume that Elizabeth's religious policies would have changed. Okay, so no more uh, strict opposition to Catholicism, no more state Protestantism. And this would have been a huge change, especially because uh, English identity in the early modern period has generally been based on the fact that A, the English are not French, so we don't want absolutism. B, the English are not Catholic. So this would have had huge changes. And also it would have severely limited the independence of England in terms of foreign policy, in terms of economic, of economy, of economic policies, during a period in which England was turning from some sort of second-rate European power, not at the same level of Spain, France or Austria, into a proper global power, okay? The British Empire or, and all this, it starts here. So, let's look in detail at how the Armada influenced England first in the short term. Now, the main effect was confirming to everyone that Elizabeth was not just the legitimate ruler, but also an effective one, okay? Keep in mind that since the excommunication that happened in 1570, her reign had been constantly threatened by revolts and plots. The country was politically divided, and here you need to think of uh, the religious groups, Anglicans, Puritans and Catholics fighting each other. Think of the court factions vying for power inside the Privy Council and inside the Royal Court. Think of the social divisions between the rich and the poor and all that. And there were still people who accused her, accused Elizabeth of being the illegitimate daughter of Henry VIII, even after some 30 years of her on the throne. So all these problems, except for poverty, poverty remained and possibly even got worse, but the political problems either disappeared or were, uh, were much more limited in scope. Also because uh, the main threat to Elizabeth, remember, was Mary Queen of Scot. She was the, this sort of magnet for plot. She was a member of the royal family. She was Catholic. She still had support in France and Scotland and England. So everybody who wanted to overthrow Elizabeth came to her. She died in 1586. And uh, that was one problem that went away. The other problem, the Spanish hostility and the fact that the plotters could rely on Spain remained until the defeat of the Armada. So these threats, as we said, were extremely real for Elizabeth, and we have discussed many of them already in detail. The Abington plot, the Ridolfi plot, uh, there were several others, but they are pretty much the same thing with a different name. Someone decides to put Mary Queen of Scots on the throne, ask, ask Spain for help, the plot is discovered, uh, Mary Queen of Scots claims she's innocent, uh, and uh, uh, the other people involved in the plot are killed. This, this uh, pattern repeats itself until the Babington plot when uh, Mary cannot claim in all good conscience anymore that she's in innocent and therefore off with her head. So, all, the number of immediate threats after 1588, after the main supporter of foreign intervention is in, in England is uh, no longer vi a viable option, starts to decrease immediately. But sir, I hear you say, what about Essex's rebellion? Well, dear student, Essex's rebellion was not against Elizabeth per se. It was a power struggle between council factions, okay? It was not to dethrone Elizabeth, but to change who was in power in the, in the, in the council. After the failure of the Armada, Elizabeth's legitimacy was not actually threatened ever again. She also presented herself, and this is important to understand, as the saviour of the country, okay? We are still here, we are still English and Protestant because of her, because of her leadership. I don't know how that is effectively true, but it is how people believed. She saved the country from an existential threat, from something that threatened to change it and change its nature. If she was a prime minister or a president today, we would say that her approval ratings would be through the roof. To conclude the first point, no more serious plot. The 
country became stronger and rallied around the victorious queen. And three, Elizabeth saw her legitimacy and position confirmed. Moving on to the medium term consequences. Let's zoom out chronologically and geographically. First, we must look at how the global superpower of the 16th century, the Spanish Habsburg Empire, the Habsburgs were the dynasty, the royal family that controlled the Spanish Empire, and also the Holy Roman Emperor in Germany. So in this period, we can talk about the Spanish Empire, but also about a Habsburg Empire, which encompassed most of Europe. As we said, uh, Philip II considered England as a key to his European strategy against France. But now he had to change his plans. He was also the main sponsor of the Catholic cause, which uh, did not look very good after his defeat. Okay? He was the main uh, superpower behind Catholicism. He was defeated and his defeat uh, emboldened Protestants all throughout Europe, making his job uh, of putting out the fires of Protestantism across the continent much more difficult. This would have important consequences in European history and in world history. Finally, arming and crewing uh, 140 ships, more or less, I think it's 138, give or take, was a huge investment in terms of manpower and in terms of money. Okay, we're talking about hundreds of people, thousands of people. We're talking about millions of uh, modern-day pounds, possibly billions in financial investments. It was not something that could be recovered very easily. It was a great loss. Now, all these factors conspired to effectively nullify okay, the Spanish threat to England in the following decades. Spain would not be an effective threat to England anymore in, in its history at all. It, limited, it also limited the Spanish presence in the region to the territories in the Netherlands. And speaking of the territories in the Netherlands, while the war against the Dutch rebels would continue for uh, 60 more years, until 1648, the entire foreign policy of Spain had to change. Okay? They could not just send soldiers from Spain to the Netherlands using the English Channel, because England which, as we said, as we've seen, did not have a very good relationship with Spain, now controlled the English Channel and did not allow warships and troop transports to pass unchallenged. So the, gra the Spanish grasp on the Dutch provinces, which, was, which were very wealthy, very technologically advanced and very strategically located between uh, France, Germany, England and Central Europe, was made much weaker by, again, the English control of the Channel and by the defeat of the Armada. Finally, the vacuum left by the Spanish retreat, the, by the fact that there was no more uh, big superpower managing the area, keeping a lead on what was going on in the area, allowed England to, emer to emerge as a strong independent actor, not just as a former Spanish ally who suddenly decided to have its own policy, its own independence. Um, now, those were the medium-term consequences, okay? So, essentially, Spain stopped being a very important actor in the region. And these had consequences for, the, for European history and the full world history. Because what is happening in Europe now will later affect the entire world. This is the time where nations start being uh, colonial nations, when Europeans start sailing away discovering new lands and conquering them. So who has the power in Europe also describes who has the power over the rest of the world in the long term. Which brings us to the last point, the long-term consequences of the failure of the Armada, which is the emergence of England as a global naval power. What do we mean with global naval power? As a, as a, a country which is able to impose its will, that it's a global power, so other countries are forced to do what England says, all across the globe. Have you ever heard of uh, Rule Britannia, Britannia Rule the Waves? This uh, catchy song, which is also some sort of national anthem of Victorian England. 
The idea that Britain was supposed to rule the waves starts here. Okay, Since the end of the Hundred Years' War, which was this very long and drawn-out conflict between England and France, which ended in uh, 1453, the English crown had realized that the Kingdom of England was now just in England, just in the island, and gave up on any ambitions they had of conquering land in France. Why is this a change? Because since the very beginning of the Kingdom of England as a thing, as a nation, as a, an independent state, we have to remember that England was more French than English. Okay? The Kingdom of England had more land in France than it had in England. Not anymore. One of the consequences of this change, the fact that England was now just in the island, was the realization that the fleet was required to defend the country, and one was built under King Henry VIII. Its beginnings were a bit difficult, but uh, it proved, uh, as we have seen with the, with the story of the Armada, it proved really a task. It was soon rec recognized as a key strategic asset of the country. Key strategic asset is a fancy way of saying England could not survive without the fleet. This uh, focus on the fact that England needed a fleet would have huge consequences in world history. Huge. First of all, England and later Britain became detached from continental politics. Okay, it would uh, mingle. Now oh, there, there is the washer and dryer here. I apologize for the noise. England would mingle much less in the affairs of the European continent and only very rarely intervened in continental wars until the 18th century. It was not a complete withdrawal, but simply the realization that colonizing the Americas and taking advantage of oceanic trade in India and in Asia was much more profitable than messing around in Europe, as Spain, France, Austria, and the other powers were doing. Eventually, by the 18th century, the English slash British navies would become the unchallenged masters of most oceans in the world. Meaning that they, if you wanted to make business in the Pacific Ocean, in the Atlantic Ocean, or in the Indian Ocean, or literally everywhere in the world, you needed to ask permission to Britain first. A position that they would so, sort of hold until the Second World War, until the mid 20th century. The beginnings of this trajectory, this uh, importance given to naval power, starts here, okay? And uh, it would eventually lead to the construction of one of the largest and most influential colonial empires that the world had ever seen, the British Empire, which would not have been possible without navies, and the navies would not have been considered as important for the survival of the country if they were not been able to destroy the Spanish Armada, or at least scatter it, because it was the bad weather that destroyed it. So, those were, uh, to sum it up, the three main consequences of the Spanish Armada. First, short term, it made Elizabeth more secure in her position. Two, it put an end to Spanish ambitions in the region. Three, it launched an age of English naval supremacy in the next centuries, which would reshape the world. Remember, all this, uh, in a slightly more uh, less detailed form, is in your notes. So, use them. Use them to answer the questions. Use them to provide names, dates, facts, and examples. If you have any problems, let me know. I'm really looking forward to reading your answers. And uh, remember, you have to answer the questions. And, uh, yes, see you next time.